Welcome to Danielle Smith's Fraser Forum. This program is part of a series of podcasts doing in-depth interviews on free enterprise and personal liberty. I'm your host, Danielle Smith, president of the Alberta Enterprise Group. Go to fraserforum.org where you can subscribe, comment on the program, and see links to the studies we discuss. You will also find archives of previous episodes. Our email address is danielle at fraserforum.org. We'd love to hear from you. One of the interesting arguments that we often hear in Canada is, well, if we, if we allow private hospitals to exist in Canada, the Americans would immediately come up and create an American healthcare system. So we're afraid of the Mayo Clinic coming to Toronto. We're afraid of Johns Hopkins setting up in downtown Calgary. Uh, we're, we're afraid of Cedars Sinai coming to downtown Vancouver. What are we afraid of when we have world-class healthcare facilities delivering some of the best healthcare in the world south of the border? Yes, there are issues in the American universals, the, the American system, but there is some incredible healthcare down there and some incredible knowledge. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had the opportunity to access some of that in this country? Well, hello again. I am delighted for this edition to be speaking with Nadim Esmail, Senior Fellow at the Fraser Institute about a topic I have been following for literally decades now, a lot because of the work of my guest as well as other scholars at the Fraser Institute. We're talking about healthcare and how we're going to fix it. Nadim, thank you so much for your time today. I sure appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I'm not kidding when I say I've been watching this for decades. Uh, I, I was a, an intern at the Fraser Institute in the mid nineties when I first got, uh, got to see the waiting your turn hospital waiting list survey. And so I have watched it every single year coming out, hoping and hoping that we were going to see trends going in the right direction. And why don't you share the bad news? What's actually happened uh, year over year in that waiting your turn survey? The trend continues to go in the wrong direction. We're reaching peaks and highs continually year after year. Uh, and we tried to dig into this and try to understand why is this happening as spending is growing. And in fact, even when you do a, a statistical analysis, the more money we put into the healthcare system in Canada, the longer the waiting lists get, which is exactly the opposite of what the OECD has found occurs in Europe, where $100 of extra per person spending brings waiting lists down. In Canada, it brings them up. That's how dysfunctional the healthcare system is. So uh, and, when can yeah. you talk a little bit about what that survey shows, just so people know where the problem lies? Because you look at a couple of things. And if I remember how you do it, you actually you ask real doctors, frontline doctors and frontline specialists, how long it's taking between between treatment, diagnosis, and as and when they get their their actual treatment. Can you can you just sort of elaborate a little bit so people understand why it's getting so bad? Uh, so the survey goes out to medical practitioners, physicians in 12 major medical specialties across the country. We contact every physician we're able to contact uh, and we ask them how long it takes for a patient to see the doctor on, a, on an elective or, or routine basis. And then we ask about a special, a specific set of surgeries and how long a patient would wait from today for those surgeries or treatments. And we also ask about the wait times for MRI, CT and ultrasound. Uh, and the wait to see the this, this surgeon or the specialist plus the wait to receive those treatments on a weighted basis gives the total wait time nationally. Uh, so we're going physician, we're going specialty by specialty, treatment by treatment, and then aggregating up based on the number of treatments actually performed to get the aggregate number. And if I recall this, you, you started this at Fraser Institute before anyone else, but there have been other waiting list surveys that 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 validate and and replicate the findings that you have, right? Uh, that's right. This was started in the early 1990s. Uh, Dr. Michael Walker, Professor Stephen Globerman uh, got together. They created the survey. It started in British Columbia, moved national. Uh, the first national, I think, was 1993. I stewarded from the 2000 to about 2012, and we have gone every year out to the uh, to the, to the medical literature, to the economic literature, to try and verify the numbers that we have. And what we found is that, if anything, waiting your turn actually understates the actual patient mm. experience in Canada. Um, certainly, governments have gone out and measured. If you look at the OECD's charts of how governments measure, the Canadian official stopwatch starts later than every other country in the developed world stopwatch begins. And we still record officially wait times that are competitive with our colleagues who start their stopwatch much earlier. Uh, it's a terrible state of waiting in this country. It's, it is a terrible state. And I guess the, the part I need you to unbundle a little bit is, is it doesn't make sense to a regular person looking at this saying, okay, we've got waiting lists. You would think the right answer would be, well, let's just give more money to healthcare. And so governments dutifully have given more money to healthcare. The federal government has given more money to healthcare. So why would it be that giving more money is resulting in worse outcomes? That just seems to be upside down. 
it, it's it's a very interesting setup. It, it, and what few people realize is that we actually have one of the developed world's best funded universal access healthcare system. Uh, the Canadian healthcare system ranks among the most expensive in the developed world. And yet international surveys show that we actually have some of the longest waiting lists for access to healthcare in the developed world. And, and it all comes from the structure of the healthcare system itself. The incentives that are ingrained in a system that has a lack of user fees, that does not have activity-based funding for hospital care, that does not have private parallel uh, provision uh, of medical services, and that does not have private competition in the delivery of hospital services. We've taken a very unique policy construct, and as a result, uh, we're doing a terrible job for Canadian patients and for the taxpayers that are funding their care. We're going to talk about each of those in detail. I want to know if the Canada Health Act itself has created these structural problems, because if you're in a position where the federal government ties funding to provinces based on these five principles, and there's something wrong with one of the five principles, then you're in a position where you're kind of locked into never changing the system. So let's see if we can go through these one at a time. And you can, and you can tell me if, if, if we, our starting point needs to be throwing out the Canada Health Act. So we've got public administration, universality, comprehensive, accessible, and I have transportable. I think that's the, 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 the final one. Let, let's talk about public administration. And when I think about that, that says to me, essentially that you have a single insurer for the services that are covered, which on the surface, I don't necessarily object to, because I can imagine it, there's probably a lot of streamlining that you have of having a, a single insurance plan. Everybody understands what you can cover, what you can't, what gets paid, as opposed to having hundreds or even more private insurers that you would have to deal with. Is is the public administration the problem or um, it, it sh should I be looking at that some other way? I think public administration is not is not one of the central concerns with the Canada Health Act, but there is a peripheral one. And that is by locking us into a single insurer. And it's interesting, public administration says it can be a nonprofit authority assigned by government. It doesn't have to be government. But by locking us into a single authority, we immediately under the Canada Health Act disallow a policy approach followed by a country like Germany, Switzerland, mm -hmm. the Netherlands, where we have multiple competing insurers inside a universal construct. Those countries understand that competing insurers allows individuals to tailor insurance policies to their own unique circumstances and needs, to adjust deductibles and premiums, to go into managed care because it might save them premium by restricting choice of physician. It gives all sorts of options, specialization for particular medical conditions. Uh, someone who's a diabetic might prefer an, insurance, an insurer that specializes in that. Someone with a heart condition might prefer that sort of a specialized insurer. This blanket one-size-fits-all approach that's, that's almost demanded by that particular principle or, or term in the Canada Health Act does disallow one policy construct, but it doesn't stop the system from being better and a better functioning healthcare system. Okay. That, that, you know, that, that's good to know. And, and we, when we get into looking at some of the individual systems as well, let's explore that a little bit more. Let's talk about universality because I think universality should mean this. It mean, should mean that nobody loses their house or goes bankrupt because of an inability to pay medical bills. It should be the coverage for catastrophic. You don't want anybody making a choice not to receive essential treatment because they're, they're, they're worried about the cost of it. So that's fine. But I don't know that this system where we have um, you have to pay for every little thing in the hospital and physician services. I don't, I don't know that that's the best definition of universality. And I, I think you've, you've, you've looked around the world and universality means a lot of different things in a lot of different places. What's the essential component of universality for you? I, I think universality is the noble goal, but it's a common goal. It's shared by just about every developed nation around the world. Uh, it's the goal of ensuring access to care regardless of ability to pay. I think there also needs to be in a time frame that, provide com that provides comfort and peace of mind. Waiting for health care is not a benign process. Health conditions advance, people deteriorate. The medications we have to take for pain while we're waiting for the joint surgery have an impact on our livers and on our livelihoods. Uh, it impacts our ability to earn a living, to look after our families, to enjoy our time with our loved ones. So to me, universality is care, uh, regardless of ability to pay in a time frame that provides comfort and peace of mind. That's not what the Canada Health Act says. Mm. Canada Health Act says 100% of the insurable population on uniform terms and conditions. So again, disallowing this opportunity for people to tailor their universal health care experience to their own unique circumstances and needs 
but generally a fairly benign goal or an important goal, but a fairly benign piece of the Canada health plan. Do, really you th do you think in Canada we can reinterpret universality the way you described, or do you think that that principle needs, do you need a, a legislative change? This is what I'm trying to, to sort of sort through as we have this conversation is how much of a straitjacket some of these principles are. Because the principle on the surface, if it's interpreted right, doesn't have to be um, a straitjacket. It actually can can be the aspirational goal all of us want to achieve. Do you think the way it's written is it prevents, it, it creates a barrier to, to some of the reforms we'll be talking about? I don't know the, the universality term specifically does, but there's an interesting thought that, that we can have what Canadian would live without a universal access healthcare system? And what Canadian province would say to its population, we're no longer going to have universal access healthcare in this country? Healthcare is a matter of provincial jurisdiction. The Canada Health Act is an exercise of the federal spending power. That is, the federal government taxes more than it requires for its own responsibilities and then redistributes that money as an exercise of the spending power. And the Canada Health Act is one of the governing conditions for it. Why have the term at all? No province is going to move away from it. No sensible government will move away from it. The federal government, to my mind, when it comes to the Canada Health Act, needs to enforce portability, the ability for people to move freely from one province to another and still be covered for a universally accessible healthcare system, I think makes a great deal of sense when it comes to labor mobility, when it comes to flexibility in the economy. But does it really need to enforce universality when we know uh, no province is going to back away from it? That's a good point. So it's, there's a, there's sort of a populace holding their governments to account on that principle. So you don't really need the heavy hand of the federal government coming in. That makes some sense. Let's uh, talk about comprehensiveness. I've never really understood what comprehensiveness means in the context of the Canada Health Act, because there are a lot of services that are not covered by the Canada Health Act. And there's a lot of services you can pay for out of pocket and you can co-pay for. And so when we talk about comprehensiveness, what what, it doesn't seem to me like it is a barrier, but I'm wondering what, what, did, what is it supposed to cover when we're talking about federal legislation and the federal spending power you just spoke about? There's almost a historical component to comprehensiveness. Comprehensiveness defines what is to be covered. Uh, and it, it, the, the healthcare system that a province sets up in order to have access to its federal transfers must cover physician services and hospital care, medically necessary physician services and hospital care. This is where this term medically necessary originates. It, it really is around comprehensiveness in the Canada Health Act. Uh, and so now we've got a healthcare system that has to be universal. It has to cover everybody. It has to have these particular services covered in it. But it's this is where the tweak comes why we don't necessarily have drugs or uh, dental services or other services within the universal construct because they're not really defined in by the Canada Health Act. And so they're not... Yeah necessary requirement. But the other parts of the Canada Health Act that do force provinces to go down a less efficient policy approach, that is a, a, a policy approach that is going to cost more and deliver less as a result of what's required by the Canada Health Act, in a manner might be considered to be tied to that other requirement where provinces are saying, well, we know we have to be inefficient because the federal government forces us to be, so we're only going to cover what they say we have to. You know, I, I wonder if an error was made in choosing physician services to be under that umbrella because not not every time you go to the doctor is it essential sometimes you're getting a renewal of a prescription sometimes you're just doing a basic checkup on an annual basis i mean you could probably argue that um that vital pharmaceuticals are more essential once you've been diagnosed with a disease you need to manage or if you've got some kind of severe toothache, going to the dentist is more essential than that, uh, than that physician visit. Uh, what, do, 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 does that exist elsewhere in other, in other jurisdictions where only the government can pay if you go to the doctor? No, that, that is a very uniquely Canadian, uh, Canadian experience where you don't have an alternative for your medically necessary care. And we do see provinces tweaking with this term medically necessary all the time, trying to balance budgets. Mm -hmm defining what is and what is not medically necessary. So what you do pay your doctor for and what you don't. We know now when you go to the doctor in Alberta, uh, you're going to pay for your doctor's note for your work because that's no longer a medically necessary service. There's a little sign on the, on the door in the exam room. This is what you're going to pay for that service. Please one problem per visit because that's how the medically necessary coverage mm -hmm. operates. It, it really all does come back to, to cost efficiency. There's a very interesting tweak that occurs here though. Uh, as we go through the Canada Health Act sections, 18 through 21 disallow cost sharing and extra billing. That is, hmm. we cannot have patients share in the cost of care consumed, and we cannot have any private top-up to services that are funded by government. Any funding by government must be complete. It can't be partial. Uh, 
When you take that and combine it with medically necessary, we now create a system where the pharmaceutical has a copay because that, that is reasonable based on how the insurance system is structured, but the physician does not. So we go to the physician with no copay, the physician prescribes the drug that is actually going to do the healing, and now there's a copay, but provinces have no way of addressing this under the Canada Health Act because the physician must be copay free. Okay, uh, well, and copay is going to be a pretty important aspect for us to to discuss when we start talking about the other systems. Let's talk about accessibility, because when when you talk about accessibility, you would think that this aspect of how long you're waiting for medically necessary treatment would factor into it. I years ago when this was litigated at the federal level and the Shawley decision came about, the decision was access to a waiting list is not access to healthcare. Sadly, that seemed to only apply in Quebec. It didn't apply to the rest of the country. I never quite understood why that was, but what does accessibility mean in this context when we're talking about the Canada Health Act? Because it means something different than, than, I, than I think it should. Uh, accessibility, it, it reinforces a lot of the other principles. We come back to ensuring everyone has access to healthcare, but this is where we come into section 12. Section 12 is, is the problematic section healthcare because it requires that patients have reasonable access to medical services. And that is entirely up to the federal government's discretion what that term means. And so we have interpretation letters that have come from the federal government and federal health ministers over time that have said private clinics providing surgical services may impede reasonable access to healthcare in the opinion of the health minister. Sounds like a very benign statement, but it's not. That is an, a direct assault on the province's freedom to determine its own policy structure because the federal government has said section 12 might come into play section 12 a violation of that means we pull back all of your cash transfers and so the federal government can at any time say under this under this particular principle we think what you're doing dear province is impeding reasonable access to health care services hmm. it could be as simple as saying alberta saskatchewan we know you're contracting out some services to private surgical facilities we appreciate the evidence that says this is a more efficient way to deliver more health care services but we think it impedes reasonable access. Uh, and, and all of a sudden now the provincial, the federal transfers are under threat. Uh, so this is the section where we really run into where the Canada Health Act poses a barrier. But, but it's, an, it's an almost undefinable barrier because it's an undefined term in the act itself. And so there's no definition to fall back mm -hmm. on. Just as important, this is not a, a justiceable act. This is not an act that can go to court and be challenged. This is an exercise of the federal spending power. So it is entirely at the federal government's discretion what this act says and how it's enforced. Wow. Let's and we'll talk about how significant those factors, those um, transfers has, have become, which is why I think there's a reluctance for provinces to to to, to try to push the envelope. I was using the word trans, transferable. The actual word is portability. The idea that you should be able to travel anywhere in the country and and get coverage. Now, do we do we succeed in that? Is our system portable? If I broke my leg in Quebec, uh, would I be able to get services there? If I needed to get my gallbladder removed, if I'm on a trip to Saskatchewan, would I be able to get it removed there? I, I guess I don't, I don't even really know how portable the system is. Yeah, it is reasonably portable. There are some issues with how some provinces are paying for care in other provinces, which has created some barriers for patients on an ongoing routine basis. But we do have a healthcare system where while you're traveling in Canada, the provinces are funding healthcare in the, in the alternate province. It also protects patients moving from province to province. So for 90 days, your province of origin will provide for your healthcare services while you meet the eligibility in the next province. So it sets some terms around that. Uh, in many ways, I think this is actually a very important part of the Canada Health Act because it does ensure labor mobility in the country. It does ensure that when you have a recession or an economic event in one province, that Canadians can move within their own country to another province mm. without being locked to a healthcare policy in a province, without being locked to a province because of their health care needs. And I think that's an important thing to have for Canada's economy generally and for Canadians generally. Okay, so let's just do a summary here. Public administration, we can live with that, although we would get a better, more tailored system if we allowed for some competition so people could tailor the program to what they actually need. Universality, great principle, uh, and it, but it can be implemented in a way that's different than how we've implemented it here. Comprehensive, we've already created the flexibility, it seems to me, within that interpretation so that we can start looking at things that are covered 100% and things that are that you have a copay for accessibility if we can get that redefined around talking about 
accessible healthcare being access and wait times, then we might be able to make it somewhere and portability we'd keep. So my general view is that there's nothing really in the Canada Health Act that is preventing, that is absolutely putting a stop on, on any transformation. Am, am I being too optimistic? I think you're being optimistic on two terms, section 12 and sections 18 through 21. Mm. Section 12 is, is the reasonable access term, the undefined term that has been used as a lever by federal governments to put the freeze on any number of policy approaches that provinces might have considered. And it's an ongoing threat because the government of the day will define what reasonable access means. Uh, even a friendly government in Ottawa to healthcare reform tomorrow uh, might be changing four years from now and that next government might have a different opinion. And sections 18 through 21 specifically disallow cost sharing or co-pays and they disallow extra billing, which, uh, which is a process we see in countries like Australia and France, where a physician only gets partially paid by the government and individuals are free to top up in certain sectors. So I think that's where the real problems in the Health Act are. The rest is less of a barrier to reform, though there are still things we can do to improve on that. That's helpful. And here's, I guess, the real problem is that the provinces have been so effective at asking the federal government to pay an increasing share towards health transfers that now the penalty of having the federal government say we're going to withdraw transfers is so high that that also acts as a, a barrier to change. I uh, think in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, uh, a couple of us had looked at what the transfers were relative to what the savings from a cost sharing program would be based on the Rand Institute study from the 1970s, which is really the only true trial of how much a cost sharing program can save. And it was possible in the early 2000s, late 1990s to actually implement reasonable health care reform and save enough money that the, the transfers could be foregone and the province would still be better off. Um, there is a private shift to patients as well, but other policies can further enhance that benefit. But now you're right, it, it, as those transfers grow, it increases the federal government's hold on the provinces. It increases the federal government's ability to stall reforms that it, mm -hmm. it finds undesirable for whatever political reason. Um, none of obviously what we're talking about here is, is a, a sound argument against sensible reform. It's a political tool and it's very much, it's very much being used in that manner. All right. Well, then let's talk about how they've managed to maintain universality in a number of high income countries around the world. I think what, what I always object to whenever we get into this conversation is that everyone says, oh, well, we don't want to be like the United States. And there are so many other jurisdictions in the world that we can look to if universality is something we want to maintain and keep some of the elements of our system. So we're not even going to talk about the United States unless we have, unless we're forced to. So let's talk about some of these other nations. And I, I, and there, it's a pretty big list: Australia, Sweden, Switzerland, France, Germany, Netherlands, UK, New Zealand. When you've done an analysis of those, why, why did you choose that grouping of nations in particular? Give us some idea of the similarities that that would allow us to to replicate some of the things that they do. Uh, going all the way back, right around the Romano report in the very early 2000s, 2001, uh, we sat down and we decided to just create a structure of league tables. Let's see how all of the countries around the developed world stack up, who, who's doing better, who's doing worse in terms of spending, uh, in terms of access to healthcare, availability of services, and then in terms of outcomes. And a number of nations stood out in this analysis. Uh, Sweden, Switzerland, Japan, France stood out as, as being leaders in terms of healthcare outcomes or outcomes from the healthcare process. And then we know there's this other group of countries that have no waiting lists for access to healthcare. It's not to say there's no waiting, it's, it's more like scheduling a haircut or scheduling a, a, an appointment for your car. They're busy Tuesday, you're busy Thursday. We'll get to you the following Wednesday, we'll do an MRI on Monday. There's no systemic waiting list or queue of people to be treated ahead of you. And that's uh, Austria, France, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Germany, um, Japan. So this subset of countries, and we decided to take a little closer look and see what's really going on. What do we find in common in all of these countries? And it's incredible. Every one of the developed world's top performing universal access healthcare systems has cost sharing for universal mm -hmm. accessible services. Care is not free at the point of use for the patient, which encourages more informed decision making about when and where it's best to access the healthcare system. Every one of them has private competition in the delivery of universally accessible hospital and surgical services, all of them. In some cases, like in Germany, it's actually university hospitals that are being privatized because Germany has figured out that when the private sector comes in, the facilities are being recapitalized, they're being upgraded, mm -hmm. they're being approved for patients. And every last one of these nations, every one of them, has a safety valve, a private alternative to the universally accessible system. Even in Sweden, which might be considered a mecca of socialist thought, 
Patients are not constrained to the universal system. They're not shackled to a government monopoly. They're free to seek care on their own terms with their own resources when they feel appropriate to do so. And about 10% of the population is privately insured. The access to the private sector is quite low in Sweden because the public system is quite good as far as patient perception is concerned. But the option is always there for them. And that is an important option to have. Let's stay with Sweden just for a minute so I can understand it, because everybody loves to point to Sweden as the model for healthcare. Socialist system, I think, is what a lot of people believe it is, and yet they've got a lot more competition and, and private delivery than we do. What, what, what happened there? Did they, did they take a U-turn or did they just develop differently? Did they have some moment of crisis where they said, okay, we've got to do things differently, or was it just incremental change? Uh, it, it seems to be incremental change, and I think there's a there's a pragmatism there behind these reforms. It, it's it's a moment of pause where everyone stops and looks around and goes, well, this isn't working, so we should try mm -hmm. something different. Uh, the cost sharing has been increasing in Sweden. It's about 20 or $25 to go see a doctor. Um, obviously, there are exemptions for low-income populations. There are exemptions for children, exemptions for the elderly. There are exemptions for people with chronic conditions. There are limits on, on annual spending every year out of pocket to protect people from serious health events and to ensure that the trade-off when people are seeking healthcare from a doctor is a trade-off between going out for dinner versus seeing a physician, a Starbucks versus seeing a physician. We're not trading off eating versus seeing a physician. That is an inappropriate trade-off to be making. The Swedes have moved into uh, into privatization, activity-based funding of hospital care. Again, recognizing that there are, there are real benefits to having the private sector involved competitively in the delivery of universally accessible services. It's in Stockholm. The hospital is called St. Goron's. It's actually run by a private for-profit company traded on the Swedish stock exchange called Capio. And that hospital has revolutionized the patient focus of hospital care. And it's a very competitive hospital that actually helped reduce hospital spending in Sweden, or at least enhance the availability of services in Sweden uh, alongside uh, a reduction in spending. I think that as Sweden moved into activity-based funding, and St. Gorns was a part of that, that change, but activity-based funding takes a lot of the credit here, the Swedes were available, avail, able to deliver 11% more healthcare for 1% less money, just as a result of the transformative reforms. And the parallel sector has always been there in Sweden. It was never outlawed, it was never forbidden. That's something that is, is across Europe, it's, it's always existed. I love the way you've worded that. So you get 11% more services for 1% less cost relative to the status quo, because oftentimes the reason why the private sector is treated with suspicion of those who don't want the system to change is, is oh, well, they'll just siphon profits off the top and the profits will then uh, go into the pockets of shareholders. And that's money that could be spent to ex expand services. So how do you, how do you, how do you address that issue? Because there's a, a real reluctance, I think, to talk about profit being an aspect of such an essential service to the, the health of our lives. I mean, I think people, maybe it's maybe it's a uniquely Canadian experience that this is one of those areas where you almost have a, a national consensus that profit shouldn't, profit shouldn't be a part of it. And so make the case for, for, for profit. Why shouldn't we be worried about that? Uh, I think first there's a misunderstanding of where profit comes from. Profit is not off the top. Profit is a residual that remains after services are delivered. Um, and profit is a great motivator. It is what motivates providers to focus on patients, to focus on the long term, to ensure services are delivered efficiently. Uh, Janos Korn, I pointed to, to a fundamental difference between government business enterprises and for-profit enterprises. And this is not just in healthcare. This is in any economic se sector. And there, there are any number of studies supporting this. Uh, the government can deliver services below standard, below expectation, and lose money continuously. There's, there's nothing to stop them from doing that. A private operator has a very different set of incentives and structures. They cannot lose money on an ongoing basis. They cannot treat patients poorly because those patients will go to another provider, especially in an activity-based funded system where money's following patients. If you don't look after people appropriately and provide the services they desire, they won't come to your facility and eventually your facility just closes. Hmm. That's where profit comes in to motivate hospitals to look after people. There are a number of important constructs that have to be in place, but there is no evidence to say that this doesn't lead to a better healthcare system. In fact, there's an abundance of evidence to say that you do get a better universal access healthcare system. Universal access healthcare system, when you have private competitive provision of medically necessary universally accessible services. Under an appropriate policy construct, money following patients is critical. Uh, we can't be paying hospitals to exist. We have to pay mm -hmm. them to care for people. Uh, and we have to have appropriate constructs and, and, and policy rules in place to ensure that there's enforcement. And an add-on to this that is incredibly beneficial, certainly from, from the experience of a number of countries, 
is reporting of hospital outcomes, reporting of adverse events, reporting hospital report cards effectively for the public, not just by government, but also done by the private sector independently, like we see in the United Kingdom. And I know we weren't going to talk about them, but we do see the United States where they are leading on hospital report cards and they actually rank hospitals based on how they're looking after patients. And there have been meaningful improvements in patient outcomes as a result of that. Exercise. Okay. Well, since you mentioned America, then I will also mention that not all hospitals that deliver private care are, are for profit anyway. I mean, the Mayo Clinic is not for profit. John Hopkins University is not for profit. Cleveland Clinic, I think, is not for profit as well. And so that's also another another model that could be built in to the system. Do you, how, how common is that to have a not-for-profit model as an alternative to publicly delivered? Uh, very common. And, and private not-for-profit and private for-profit, the meaningful distinction is who is the residual claimant of the profit. Uh, in a for-profit, obviously, is the shareholder, the owner, um, the shareholders, plural. Whereas in a not-for-profit, it's the entity because there's no ability to redistribute that profit. It doesn't mean that in a private organization, a not-for-profit isn't seeking to have a surplus or a residual because that does allow them then to fund things like research, to fund all the things that create that prestige around a facility like a Johns Hopkins or a Mayo. That's distinctly different from a government business enterprise where the residual simply goes back to government. The incentive is to ensure that all of the money is consumed mm -hmm. in whatever manner, not necessarily in a patient-focused manner, depending on the incentives of the payment system. Um, one of the interesting arguments that we often hear in Canada is, well, if we, if we allow private hospitals to exist in Canada, the Americans would immediately come up and create an American healthcare system. But I think you make the exact right point. So we're afraid of the Mayo Clinic coming to Toronto. We're afraid of Johns Hopkins setting up in downtown Calgary. Uh, we're, we're afraid of Cedars Sinai coming to downtown Vancouver. What are we afraid of when we have world class healthcare facilities delivering some of the best healthcare in the world south of the border? Yes, there are issues in the American universal, the, the American system. Uh, and, and I think people who are very focused on universality don't entirely understand the issues that are happening south of the border. But there is some incredible healthcare down there and some incredible knowledge. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had the opportunity to access some of that in this country? I love the way you described this, though, as it, we're not talking about taking money off the top. It's what happens to the residual. So in a for-profit model, residual from delivering good service at a better cost and attracting more patients d delivers that residual that goes to shareholders. The residual in a nonprofit would again go back to reinvestment in the nonprofit and the residual in the public sector would go back to government. But wouldn't that be the solution? Wouldn't it be telling the hospital system, hey, if you get some residual, you can buy that fancy new equipment. You can expand that wing of the hospital. You can hire more staff. Could you, could you create a model within our public system that would give the incentive for efficiency, knowing that the reward of that would stay within the hospital? I think changing the way we fund hospital care does in a manner create that approach. Uh, so activity-based funding. Currently in Canada, we fund hospitals largely on global grants. There's a small portion of activity-based activity, activity -based funding in Ontario, but that's kind of it right now. Uh, and so every year hospitals get a great big bag of money and they're told, go look after people. And the incentives are fairly clear then. We want to treat as few patients as possible, fill the hospital with reasonably healthy patients because they don't cost very much to care for. Bed blocking is a very interesting activity in that approach. Uh, inefficiency in the use of OR is actually beneficial to the hospital from a budgetary perspective because every patient is a drain on the budget. Uh, if we turn that around and have money follow patients to hospitals and say to the hospital, we'll have some fund for you to exist because obviously there are things that occur that really can't be activity funded. But generally speaking, every patient is going to bring to the door a small bag of money with them based on the medical condition they're presenting with and, and certain unique characteristics that will uh, impact the cost of their care. And the more patients you treat, the more you will earn hospital and the more patients you'll be able to treat, and the more you'll have this residual to do whatever you want with internally within your facility. That turns the system entirely on its head. And all of a sudden, you do have a system very much like this where hospitals now, if they were to expand, invest in new medical technologies, invest in better use of their OR, better scheduling systems, uh, change the way they're, they're operating services so that they're reducing costs where it doesn't make sense to patients and focusing on patients, attracting patients to the hospital. Shorter waiting times would be one of the options in there. Uh, we're creating that effective market system with government-owned hospitals. Having private for-profit and not-for-profit delivery, private competitive delivery inside that construct further enhances that because of the incentives that are associated with private ownership, both for and not-for-profit relative to government. I think the current system is a great example of how not to do it exactly, though. We, we have any number of investments that have been made where the hospital's gone, raised the money charitably, created and built a new wing, but it doesn't open because the government won't fund mm. it. 
They bought a new MRI and it goes in a closet because the government won't fund it. Activity-based funding now changes that system entirely and, and leaves it up to the hospital to decide what investments make sense and what don't. Uh, maybe aside from capital, but certainly on the operating side. You know, it doesn't make the health administrators look very good, the way you've described this. It, it, to, to, because you think that people get into the caring profession because they want to deliver the best possible care to as many patients as possible and make sure that they have as many great outcomes as possible. It seems bizarre that someone would go into that caring profession with the idea of not using the resources to full capacity and not getting the best equipment and reducing the amount of operating room room space. I, there's, there's something that I, I think I'm kind of missing about what, what an administrator is trying to achieve with that. I don't think it's about the people. I think it's about the incentives that are so that, that are ingrained in the system for those people. We have some of the best medical practitioners in the world. We know this. But when you have a physician who has a limit on how much operating time they can receive, when you have young physicians who can't get jobs and accessing operating rooms, it's not about the physician that we have a long waiting list. It's because the system isn't allowing them to operate. Hmm. We, we may have very well-intentioned hospital administrators who want to do the very best for patients, but they know every year they get a budget and they can't exceed that budget. Or if they do, there will be some difficult conversations and ultimately it'll be funded in, but they won't be fun conversations. And so it, it, the incentive for them is to ensure that they don't exceed that budget, which means the summer slowdown for surgical services, the Christmas slowdown, it assists them on a budgetary basis. Hmm. It's about the incentives in the system. It's not about the people. We have great people in the healthcare system. They just need the right incentives. You know, I think this became tragically apparent in the last year as we were dealing with the COVID pandemic because we had no capacity in our, our hospital beds, our acute care beds, and no real capacity in our ICU. And you mentioned this, that there's an incentive for uh, hospitals to keep relatively low cost patients in the system. So you, you mentioned the term bed blockers. So is, is that what's happening is that to have the bed full, it at least allows for some justification. I'm trying to understand it. I'm trying to, I'm really tr struggling to, to see this through because it would seem to me you'd want to um, have that patient in an appropriate facility in a long-term care facility as quickly as possible to open up that bed so that you could treat more patients. So I'm, I'm trying to, to understand w why the incentive is to keep those beds blocked with patients who shouldn't be there. Uh, if you think from a budgetary perspective, every patient who comes to the door increases the cost of the hospital. And a patient with a higher level of acuity or a more serious condition will increase cost more than a patient who is reasonably healthy. Mm. So a patient who's come in and been treated now is in a bed in the hospital, which is limiting access to that particular bed. And if that patient is in reasonably good shape, we're now basically providing hospital hotel services for that individual. So the, the medical care requirement is quite low, which makes them less costly than clearing that bed and allowing the next difficult patient in. I think a lot of what we're suffering though is years of chronic underfunding or years of mm. what might be coined political intended, politically intended funding. Uh, we did an analysis in, in British Columbia a number of years ago now looking at non-medical workers in the hospital system and found pay differentials of 20 or 30 percent more in a hospital for services that in many ways are not different from hotel services. I mean, a hospital is in some ways a giant hotel for sick people. It still needs bakers. There's no reason they should make 30 or 40 percent more than a pastry mm -hmm. chef at a downtown hotel, but apparently the bread is very good at the hospital. Um, there's cleaning services. Those are a little more difficult, but the pay differential is only about 17, 18 percent. Payroll mm -hmm. cards were making 30 or 40 percent more. Chefs were making more. Uh, it's interesting where the money has gone, and you can sort of follow the political will on it. And we've got a healthcare system, I recall, and we have to rewind a little bit. There was a WestJet flight that was coming in. It had an event in the air. It had to land in Calgary on an emergency. And one of the news reports that came out shortly afterwards was if this plane had had a serious event and we had a large number of injuries, we actually don't have enough emergency space in the city of Calgary, a city of over a million people, to look after one plane of individuals, 150, 200 people, in serious medical distress. This is in a modern advanced economy and one of the best funded universal access healthcare systems in the developed world. To, to put a point on it, in one of the best funded systems in the country, Alberta is a reasonably wealthy province, and we couldn't deal with an airplane landing at the Calgary airport with a serious number of injured, injured individuals because of a serious turbulence event. We're now going through a pandemic with this same healthcare system. It's years of underfunding that have brought us to this point. It's well time we fix this thing just in case this happens again. Let's be ready and prepared with a better healthcare system. So when you say years of underfunding, do you mean funding the wrong way or do you mean actually not enough dollars? 
uh, funding the wrong way. We've got more than enough money. We've been one of the developed world's best funded healthcare systems for many, many years, but they're not going where they need to be. They're, they're, they're directed into the wrong areas. All right. Let's then talk a little bit more about some of the other systems, because I want to see where the similarities are. You, you went through in, in detail talking about Sweden. One other aspect I wanted to ask you about, though, was why is a private company incentivized to recapitalize? It was sort of interesting the way you worded that, as they were quite excited for this private hospital to come in because then they went and fixed everything up. You, you just challenge those who think that that is not what happens. There's a, I think a, uh, many people have a misconception about what it is that once you've made a profit, what it is that owners do with that profit. Um, but why, why would a private hospital, rather than pay that out as a dividend to a shareholder, why would they recapitalize? What would be the point of that? The perspective is on the long term. Uh, as the private operator is running the facility, what they want to do is find ways to get more patients through the facility efficiently at a high quality so that they can see more patients and increase the resources available to the hospital as money is following patients in the healthcare system. I think one of the best examples in Sweden actually comes from nursing care. Uh, the nurses, when the hospital was run by the government, had often gone to the administrators and said, well, if we make this change or that change, we can see patients more efficiently, we can see more patients through the facility, and the administrator said, well, we'll kick it up the chain and we'll see what, what the chain brings down and eventually we'll make the change. Post-privatization, the nurses would go to the administrator and say, well, if you move this over there and did that thing over there, all of a sudden we could increase the number of patients through the ward, and the administrator went, great, that's more patients through the facility, that's an increase in revenues, an increase in profit, Let's make that change. Let's get it done right now. The nurses are more satisfied. They're getting to do, they have more control. They're getting to do the things they want. The owner is more satisfied because their profitability has gone up as a result of reinvesting that profit for the long term, for creating a business that has sustainability, that, that can see more patients ultimately and eventually. And why wouldn't that happen in the public sector? Like you would think that there would be some incentive. If you do, if you are doing all this rationing, you're keeping the low cost bed blockers in place, you're reducing the amount of operating room time, you'd think there'd be a surplus at the end that you would then be able to to, to spend on the, the diagnostic equipment and uh, improving the facility. Why doesn't that happen in the public sector? Again, I think it comes back to the incentives. If you go up to the hospital administrator today and say, okay, hospital administrator, if we spend $200,000 over here, we can see 200 more patients next year. Well, the administrator will go, okay, so now I'm going to take 200000 from the budget I get every year to look after people to look after more people and I don't get any more money mm. for them. That doesn't make any sense. Let's just keep doing things the way we are. Um, it's fine that we don't have great patient throughput. We could change the way we fund the hospital and now have activity-based funding. Uh, and, and that changes the incentives to the hospital administrator and brings in a lot of that, a lot of the incentives that are associated with private sector activity because money's following patients. Changing the way we pay for hospital care has a meaningful impact on how hospitals behave and how they react to changes like this because it changes the, the perception of a patient from a cost to someone bringing resources to the hospital. And that is enhanced with private competition, but it's not well, actually a necessary component. Uh, I know that this is such a central element to reforming the system that I want to look at just a couple more jurisdictions to understand if it's implemented in a different way. Let's talk a bit about Australia. And, I, and I, I like talking about Australia because they sort of have a similar history to Canada. And so you'd think, have we followed a similar route when it, when it comes to structuring our, our public services? So, so tell us what happens there. Uh, Australia is a very interesting country. They've actually gone the direction of encouraging high-income individuals to have private parallel healthcare insurance so that they don't put a burden on the universal access healthcare system. Uh, so in Australia, there are there is cost sharing for, uh, for services, so there are some fees to be paid. There is a top-up system. Physicians can opt out of direct billing to government. They can bill patients directly and ask patients to top up over the government fee, or in exchange for billing government directly, they only charge the government fee. Um, when it comes to the surgical services, it can be done in the private sector, it can be done in the public sector. There's a sharing of services, there's a sharing of physicians. There are some very interesting tweaks to that. What's fascinating about Australia is there are inducements to go into private health care insurance. And those inducements were created uh, in order to encourage people off the public waiting list into the public hospital. Uh, and Ian Harper from the, University, from the Business School of Melbourne at the time uh, actually looked at what happened to public hospital spending and what he found is that as these incentives were created for people to privately insure for medically necessary services, the growth rate of public hospital spending capped off. And so the government was effectively saving itself money every year by encouraging people into private insurance with subsidies 
because they didn't have to pay for the public hospital care. And there's a substantial amount of care in Australia that actually happens in the private parallel system. And let's step back for a minute and remember, this is a universally accessible system, access to care regardless of ability to pay, with shorter waiting lists than we have in Canada, with lower expenditures as a share of GDP than we have in Canada. Hmm. They spend less, they wait less, and they encourage private sector insurance. So the idea being, once you reach a certain level of income, we don't want to subsidize you anymore. You should pay for it yourself. That's that's the prevailing attitude. Correct. But you're also still paying your taxes as a high income earner. It is, mm. it is a, a country not dissimilar from Canada. So you're paying for the care of those in a lower state of income, for those in a higher state uh, of at least an income terms needs. But as a high income individual, we expect or encourage you to have a private insurance construct. And we expect you to do that at a fairly young age so that there's also cross subsidization from younger high income individuals mm. to older high income individuals. So, the talk, so then how do, do, how do they deal with this question of activity-based funding? Do, do private hospitals with private insurance patients get funded one way and public hospitals get funded on the same block mo funding model as we do, or is it all activity-based? It's activity-based funding within the universal access construct. So as far as the public system is concerned, when patients are going to a hospital, be that a public hospital or a private registered hospital that's included in the scheme, the dollar amount that follows the patient, same as in Sweden, is fixed. Hmm. It gets looked after and the patient gets to choose their facility. So the patient can choose to go to the government facility. They can choose to go to the private nonprofit or the private for-profit. They take their money with them. The dollar amount is fixed. When we go into the private system, there's a cost share that comes in. So the public system still pays a little bit into the private care alongside the subsidy, but then the individual is expected to top up. Well, once again, that also <laughs> underscores your point about the importance of activity-based funding, because if you're a public hospital and you're able to deliver great service and great care and have a good reputation and attract some of those private patients, then that gives you more money into, your, into the system to, to treat them, doesn't it? Well, absolutely. And I think one of the things that happens as well over time is we find as activity-based funding takes hold as these opportunities open up, the private sector tends to specialize towards routine care or, or care that might be considered almost an assembly line type of care. Hip surgeries, knee replacements, cataract surgeries, things that can be done in a fairly predictable sense with a fairly predictable cost base with a fairly predictable outcome as long as care is delivered well. That actually turns public hospitals into centers of excellence for very advanced care where the outcomes are a little more difficult to understand, where the cost base is less predictable and there may be more consequences. And so the profitability is not easily understood up front. And that is actually not a bad thing if you think we take all the lower acuity patients who really don't need to be in a giant tertiary facility, who really don't need to be in a complex medical facility with all of the things that entails, including all of the negative things that entails, they can be in a place that suits their particular medical condition. And now we can focus in the public hospital on those patients who really do need that level of intensity and care. Okay, I have to get you then to myth bust on another misconception or preconception because oftentimes you'll hear critics of, of, of establishing this parallel private or uh, establishing private hospitals is that it will just cream off the top of the very best practitioners and you'll end up with the best surgeons and the best cancer doctors and the best heart surgeons in the private facilities, which will deprive those who, who need to have the public service of the very best medical care. What happens in practice in Australia? Uh, in practice, the surgeons split their time between the public and private system. Mm. There, there is a prestige associated with being in the hospital that delivers the most complex tertiary care. Surgeons don't always want to be doing the routine medicine. They want to be doing something that challenges their skills and needs. Uh, in Australia, the private surgeon is actually able to see private patients in the public hospital office. And that means they're accessible to the public hospital when they're required to be there and it encourages them to stay. There is a policy construct that has been proposed by those who make this claim that would actually create that to be a reality in Canada. Those who say the best surgeons will leave the public system, uh, also argue, therefore, we should have surgeons either in or out of the public system and mandate that. Hmm. That would create exactly the problem they're, they're wanting. What we should allow is dual practice for physicians. Let them be in the public system and the private system. We know from international experience that the number of surgeons who could move exclusively into the private setting is actually not very high. It will be a percentage, as, a small percentage, as long as we have a well-functioning universal system. And they'll want to be in the universal system for a chunk of their time. We know surgeons have some extra time. We know there are surgeons in Canada who can't get operating time because of operating time limitations. We know we have unemployed orthopedic surgeons in Canada graduating out of medical school, finishing their, their, their practical work. They're ready to be surgeons, 
they can't get a placement in a hospital with surgical time. So we have these additional resources. Let's make better use of the resources that are already idle in Canada. Give patients a chance to access those resources in those physicians' additional time that's available and let physicians decide the right blend. There are constraints we can put in to limit how much time goes into each system. Certainly a lot of countries have studied that, but there's no reason to say physicians have to be in or out. And certainly the international experience is that if you allow physicians to a practice, hmm. you'll get some great benefit as a result. Well, I'm trying to think of how that would work in practice in Canada. So what I'm hearing you say is that you'd have, say, orthopedic surgeon. That's a good example. They might have their own surgical center, their own private surgical center, and they would do those low acuity patients two or three days a week. And then they'd have one day a week where it's the more complicated patients that they do in the hospital. And in both, they'd see publicly funded patients. And in both, they'd see private insured patients. And they would just move back and forth seamlessly between the two, but able to do more surgeries in a given week. Absolutely. In fact, to the Canadian experience, that surgeon may only have one operating day a week in the public hospital. So now they can operate every Thursday, maybe Thursday, Friday, maybe they have 12 hours. What do they do outside of all those hours? Uh, between their consults, there may be more time they can access. And there, mm -hmm. There's also the labor leisure trade-off. Uh, a surgeon may be willing to do more surgical time than they currently do if that surgical time was better funded, which might be possible in the private sector. None of these are necessarily certain in terms of cost, but what we do know is that we have medical resources that are idle in Canada, surgical resources. Let's put them to better use. Let's use the ORs for longer hours, even if that is privately funded. Uh, that doesn't change the number of public hours that are available, but it does change the number of patients that are being treated in Canada. Let me ask you the same question I asked about Sweden. Was there an aha moment that we've got to do this thing differently? Or was there was there um, just an incremental change that happened over time? Because that notion of if you are high enough income, you've got to pay for yourself. Um, I've, I've, I've advocated that in the past, but I, I wonder how it gained political currency so that they were able to implement it. Do you, can you shed some light on that? How do, you, how do you make a big change like that? I think as we look to Australia and we look around the developed world, what we see is, is, is progressive change. Uh, Activity-based funding started to be experimented with in the early 1980s. We've now come 30 years forward, just about every developed nation has, has really moved into activity-based funding in a meaningful way, Canada being one of a very small subset of laggards. I think what has happened in Canada is we, we've, we've really embraced this false dichotomy. This false dichotomy has really taken hold of the public. Uh, and there's a belief that in Canada, there's the Canadian universal way, which has its downsides, it has its waiting lists, and it's people suffering as a result, but at least everyone's covered or there's the American non-universal way where apparently, and there's not necessarily any truth to this, but apparently people die in hospital corridors and you have to swipe your credit card at the door of the ambulance and they won't take you to the hospital. Uh, and people, low income people die uninsured, which is not true. It's actually not the lowest income. It's, it's the gap between not quite low enough income to be covered by the public system, but not quite mm. high income to be into the private scheme, which is where a lot of the work has been done. But this misunderstood American system has been used to, to, in, in, to, to scare Canadians to embrace this government managed system. And, and certainly there, there have been political benefits to doing that. There are some very powerful voting blocks associated with the public system. What we find around the developed world though is, is countries are moving away from that model. Even the UK years and years ago started moving away from the system that we embraced in the 1960s. They started moving towards activity-based funding to choice for hospital care. They've always had a private parallel healthcare system in the United Kingdom. They just haven't necessarily had some of the other constructs. Uh, and so it's just a, a progressive change over time as countries look to one another and say, well, hang on a second. That's really working over in Sweden. Hmm. They've embraced activity-based funding. They're getting 11% more care for 1% less money. If we look province to province, the differential in cost efficiency is about 13% between activity-based funding and global budgets. Maybe this is something we should do over here. Whereas in Canada, we seem to look over there and go, that's a great idea. Let's do a little study over here, but let's not be the American system. Let's not change. And that has really been to the detriment of patients and, and taxpayers. There's one last jurisdiction I want you to, to get into. And when we were talking about which ones we talk about, we said Switzerland, because I, I like the structure of Switzerland and you described it. Let's look at Switzerland as a stretch goal because they do things quite a bit differently than we do here. But in some ways, uh, in an optimal way, in a lot of ways, in an optimal way, because it operates, in my view, a little bit more like the traditional kind of insurances that we're used to for our homes or for our cars. And I think because it's a uh, traditional insurance is structured that way, there must be some good reasons for it. We haven't really talked much about co-payments, but perhaps we will when we, when we understand a little bit more about how Sweden or Switzerland operates. Now I, I do, you've made the case 
very well about activity-based funding being central. I think you've made the case very well as well about the need to have um, a mix of delivery models, public, private, not profit. And so we haven't talked as much about this issue of co-payments. Why is it that putting some of your own skin in the game, some of your own money on the line, what, what, what does that prompt in changing the way the system operates? What happens? What's the psychology there? I, I think it really comes down to how, encouraging patients to make a more informed decision about when and where it's best to access the healthcare system. As a patient in Canada, in a Canadian province, I can go to the emergency room, I can go to my, uh, my general practitioner. If I had a referral within six months, I can get out to my specialist. To me as an individual, there's no cost difference between the three. To the taxpayer, there's a meaningful difference between the three. Hmm. Uh, I can even go to my pharmacist, again, another meaningful difference. But it doesn't matter where I go, I pay the same amount as a Canadian, I pay nothing, the taxpayer covers the entire bill for me. When we go to a country like Switzerland, where we have a deductible, uh, and that deductible is entirely funded by the patient up until a certain amount is met. After that, there's a copay to a second amount. Now, as an individual, I'm acutely aware of how much that emergency room might cost me relative to a general mm -hmm. practitioner. I could go directly to the specialist if I'm absolutely convinced I need to see my heart surgeon and I know he's more expensive than the GP, but less than the hospital. I'm just going to go directly there, but I'll be paying for it so I can make that decision about whether it makes sense for me to go direct, go to my GP, get the referral, because it's my money now. Uh, and I'm spending it as an individual. Again, trading off a dinner out, a Starbucks versus healthcare, never trading off shelter or food versus healthcare. That's where the protections have to be in place. And when catastrophic events occur, again, limiting the amount that is out of pocket because that's where insurance comes into play. But it's about encouraging people to think about the varying costs of these different areas of healthcare. Nurse practitioners, pharmacist practitioners, who should I be seeing for my particular healthcare condition? Switzerland is very interesting in that it actually allows people to tailor their copay within the universal construct. Um, if we think from the Canadian perspective, we are we are locked in, in this old, this old and, and now long left behind healthcare model where government is monopolistic, where government provides all the healthcare services, where there are no kill pays. Uh, pretty much everyone in Europe is, is has long ago abandoned or is moving rapidly away from this. Sweden is, is maybe the first step we move into some private provision of services, not a lot. We have activity-based funding, we have some cost sharing, we have a parallel system. Australia is the next step. We have a little more cost sharing. We have inducements to go in the private system. Switzerland now, it's private insurance within the universal. Mm. So as a Swiss individual, you go out into the marketplace and you purchase your healthcare insurance policy from one of the universal insurers. Universal insurers are not allowed to risk rate. They can only rate based on the area you live in and there are only three premium variations allowed within an area and they must take all comers. There is a standard program which has a standard deductible and a standard uh, copay after deductible, but you can increase that if you want and reduce your insurance premium if you're willing to individual to take on greater risk. You can also go into managed care programs which vary the deductible construct and limit your choice of provider to bring your premium down. Uh, as an insured individual now, you have your private insurance, you go to the healthcare provider, either covered by your insurance or provider of your choice, depending on your policy. You take your standard rate card with you, the provider gets paid the standard rate card, takes the standard amount for deductible, and you can choose between the private or the public hospital, mm -hmm. the private for-profit or the non-profit. It's entirely up to you as an individual. If you're not comfortable with the private for-profit hospital, not a problem. Go to the increasingly uncommon government hospital, but they're out there, or go to the private hospital, you get to select. And everyone in that system is very focused on the patient because the money's always following the patient through the healthcare system. Now, what happens in a universal construct? I'm an individual, I can't afford my insurance. That's okay, the government will provide me a transfer for the cost of my insurance to go and seek it in the marketplace. So mm -hmm. even as a low-income individual, you're not denied the opportunity that others have in the marketplace. You're given that same opportunity with a voucher now to go seek out private healthcare insurance on your own terms backed by the taxpayer to ensure that you still have access to the system and a waiver for deductibles and copay. So you don't have to pay them, but you still get to choose your insurance company. You still get to choose from managed care or not. It's a system that is very patient focused, very individual focused. And it's a healthcare system that that, that really is at the top of its class, world-class healthcare outcomes, hmm. no systemic delay in access to healthcare services and some of the finest medical facilities that you would find in the world. It's a really great healthcare system that has been created by private for-profit healthcare providers that has been created by money falling patients, that has been created by competition and appropriate incentives. There was a referendum in Sweden where they actually asked the public, do you want to go to a more Canadian style approach or stay with what we have? And what we have won. Uh, 
uh, and, and I, I don't know all the fine details of what was marketed mm -hmm. out there, but thank goodness they chose that because they would have been choosing a system that has none of the joys and, and wonders they have in healthcare of having healthcare available when you need it in a universal basis as a result of competition. That's kind of remarkable, um, but I imagine that there must have been a referendum because there are a group of people who are unhappy with elements of the Swiss system. And I suppose it's enticing to think that you would never have to pay a dollar out of pocket for, for medical care. And maybe that's part of part of the, the, the challenge is that some people do believe that you shouldn't have to pay any money out of pocket for medical care because it's so important, it's so valuable, it's so necessary. Why should we pay for it at all? Is there is there some argument you would you would make uh, to challenge that notion? I, I think it's not about paying for the healthcare. Someone has to pay for the healthcare at some point. We often hear the term free healthcare. Well, it's not free. It costs thousands of dollars per family a year in taxes that go to the healthcare system. The taxpayer does foot the bill. Cost sharing is not about paying for healthcare. It's about encouraging more informed decision making. Let's step back a minute to our, our initial conversation about the Canada Health Act and drugs and physicians. In Canada, I will go to my physician at no charge to me. So I can go to my emergency room, my pharmacist, my nurse practitioner, my general practitioner, or as long as I have a recent referral, my specialist at no charge to me as an individual, the taxpayer pays the bill. I'll then get a script for a drug that is going to actually do the healing now that it's been properly identified by the medical uh, professional. That drug I now have a copay for, whether I'm in my public scheme or my private scheme, uh, depending on my particular income level, of course, there are, there are protections for low-income individuals. What if we turn that system on its head? What if we say to people, we know drug compliance is an issue. We know drug compliance results in readmissions and additional physician visits and poorer outcomes. What if we say to people, you must pay to go see the doctor and get the initial script because we want you to be informed about where you're going to the healthcare system. And maybe we say the general practitioner is no copay, but you'll pay for specialist care and emergency care and other things. But when you get that script, the drug is now no copay because we're thinking of a system in a complete and holistic sense. Mm -hmm. We have a private option, we have a private alternative, we have copays, we have private competition. So now the system is efficient and we can afford to have these additional services. That's a very different way now about thinking about copays and about thinking about the cost of drugs and drug compliance and encouraging greater drug compliance. There's some interesting work that was being done around this in, in the 2000s around what is an optimal copay structure. The problem, I think, from a Canadian perspective is we're already paying enough for a world-class healthcare system. We're paying more than just about anybody else is for healthcare right now. We don't have the healthcare system show for it. We're buying the, if you want to go to, to houses, we're, we're buying the great big estate in downtown Toronto. The problem is we're getting the shack in a really not great part of town. Um, and, and if we change our construct and we think about healthcare more in a more informed way, I think, when it comes to healthcare policy, when we think about what all these constructs can do, what they have already done for Sweden, for Switzerland, for for Australia, for other countries, the Netherlands, France, the Netherlands eliminated a waiting list problem by embracing mm. this, this Swiss approach to healthcare. They had a waiting list problem. They became more like Switzerland. Now the waiting list problem's gone. Mm. There's it's all these things. If we think about that, we can then think more intelligently about how do some of these other services that are not covered in Canada fit in properly. I think where we are now, we shouldn't be tacking anything on. We need to fix the problem we have. We're just going to create a bigger problem for ourselves. To talk to me a bit because I think you've done some work on how much the copay needs to be to change behavior. And it's surprisingly low. It's not like you need to charge thousands of dollars in either copayments or deductibles. What 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 would be the guide there? Uh, there's no real guide. There's a lot of experience to sort of frame thinking. Uh, if we look at what happened in the Rand Health Insurance Experiment, they did a 25, a 50, and a 95% copay. And certainly the 95 reduced access to healthcare services more than the 25. What was very interesting is, is the majority of the horsepower was zero to 25. Hmm. And if we look at a country like the Slovak Republic, they instituted copays in the 2000s and the dollar amounts were quite small relative to the average industrial income. If you took it as a share, it was four or five dollars to go see a doctor, to go to the emergency room, a couple of dollars to see a general practitioner, nurse practitioner. And the reductions in access to healthcare service were in the range of 20 to 30%. Hmm. So a meaningful difference in the number of people accessing the healthcare systems. Now, studies show that generally speaking, there's going to be no health impact. There is a reduction in both necessary and unnecessary healthcare uses uh, as, as viewed uh, ex post. However, on balance, there does not appear to be a negative impact on individuals, except for those in a state of low income with chronic healthcare hmm. conditions. So obviously a clear exemption for them. Uh, but what we see is now a healthcare system that has additional resources and time to look after the problems that do present to it that has lower waiting lists for very small dollar amounts. Uh, it, it needs to be, even in the Swedish case, it's 20 or $25. Uh, 
to go see a practitioner, maybe up to 50, depending on, on what area we're talking about and which practitioner. But if you think from, from the perspective of a middle-income Canadian, a $20 to see a practitioner amount is not a massive trade-off, as long as we're not talking about someone in a state of low income or someone with a chronic condition who's continually mm -hmm. seeing doctors day after day. So you could, you could make exemptions from co-payments and you could also, if you want, as you say, for people not to have a barrier to getting their pharmaceutical drugs, because that's a way to make sure that condition doesn't deteriorate, you could create a system where you, where you take the co-payment off that. So you, you can actually manage around some of those issues. Let me, let me ask you about one of the other challenges uh, with activity-based funding to see if there's a way to manage around this. I think there'd be a concern that if you're getting funding following the patient, then all of a sudden you get surcharged for every little thing. So now you have a meal charge and you've got the charge for the Q-tips and you've got the charge for the changing of the towels in the bathroom that you use. That's one issue. The other issue is, do you end up with patients being, um, with doctors chasing after dollars based on the diagnosis? And the most recent example is the stories that came out of the United States with COVID, anal with a COVID diagnosis, that if you came in with a, regular old respiratory problem, it was a $13,000 charge. But if it was a COVID patient, now it's a $39,000 charge. And I wonder if there's a danger by setting up incentives on the payment that you do end up with a sum trying to uh, trying to increase the amount of, of payments that they get just by changing the diagnosis. Is that a concern? I think there's three ways to, to, to look at There's three important things to think about. And the first is we already have some, some harmful incentives in the healthcare system right now. Uh, a big concern is cherry picking around, uh, around activity-based funding that hospitals will pick off the easiest, most profitable patients. But as a global budget hospital, you already want the easiest, most profitable patients because you want to maintain your budget to the end of the year or consume it in, in non-patient areas um, because those are, that's the incentive structure that is created for the hospital. So we already have that incentive there. The question is, which is the greater? The evidence around the world is, is not super clear, but certainly what we're seeing now is emerging evidence that moving to activity-based funding actually does improve outcomes and improve adherence to best practices. It is government that is setting these structures up, and it is government that has control and levers over this. So there's nothing stopping the government from saying, we will introduce activity-based funding. You hospital cannot charge extra for accommodation services. You cannot charge extra for these things. And we will very publicly air if you are. Not only will we come and audit you and charge you and penalize you for these things, we will also make a great big public fuss because there is no court like the court of public opinion when it comes to a provider acting outside of the interests of the general public. And certainly we see that around the developed world when a hospital has acted inappropriately, the, the, the weight of the public opinion coming down on them is, is substantial and there's certainly consequences for them to be had. We also know from around the developed world that regular audits, that penalties for hospitals that violate certain rules or that have certain negative outcomes are very effective tools within this construct. Mm -hmm. And the last piece I, I think is, is the importance of competition in all of this. You as a patient now in an activity-based funded system can choose your hospitals. And you can choose to go to the hospital on the north side, but everybody knows that hospital charges more and serves the worst food in town, but their medical outcomes are no different than the hospital on the east side of town that has great food and really looks after their patients and has a concierge at the front door. It's a Medicare card taking you to either of them for exactly the same amount of copay based on what the government is requiring. Where would you go as a patient? Immediately it changes behavior. And, and I think we underappreciate the, the power of competition in that world. Well, I'm a foodie, so you know, I would definitely go to the one with the better food. Let me, um, I, I don't want to get too far down this track. We could probably do another whole segment on it, but you've clearly articulated, I think, why it is the Canada Health Act prevents us from moving in the direction of some of the more successful universal systems. What I find astounding is that we're now talking about the federal government in Canada taking over more of the um, delivery or management of health services that have been in the provincial domain, the discussion of a national pharmacare program, for instance, the discussion of a national long-term care approach, for instance. As After having this conversation with you, I don't want the federal government to go anywhere near those. And so, so tell, tell me why this is, though. Like, what is the enticement for thinking that the federal government has all the solutions when clearly you've just, um, you've just demonstrated that the federal government in this case is the problem? I think the federal government has very few solutions. This is this is politics, uh, and this is this is this is purely politics. 
healthcare is the third rail. Uh, I think uh, Premier Klein in Alberta many, many years ago said it is always politically expedient to wrap yourself in a flag and proclaim yourself the defender of Medicare. I suppose it's just as expedient to say you're going to be the expander of Medicare. Um, we know the federal government is only involved in healthcare as a, as, as a function of the federal spending power. Uh, it is taxing more than it needs for its own needs and then, uh, or for its own responsibilities, I should say, and then transferring those money to, that money to provinces under a certain set of terms and conditions. We could just get the federal government out of it and leave the provinces to decide because it is their constitutional responsibility. It, it's in their con under the constitution. Healthcare is provincial jurisdiction exclusively for decision making. And, and let's not forget what Roy Romano said. If you got in a car and drove from the tip of Newfoundland to Victoria, you go through 10 very different provinces with 10 different economic realities, with 10 different demographic realities. These are 10 provinces that need 10 different policy constructs for healthcare. A one size fits all solution from Ottawa is counterproductive. It, it, it one, moves decision making further away from the people who are voting for government, which means we now come into these federal dynamics where Ontario and Quebec determine what the federal government wants for places as distant as Newfoundland and British Columbia, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to populations that are voting for their premier and their province with their own construct. I think we could take some great lessons from, from welfare reform in the 1990s, where provinces were given a free hand, they were given open transfers, the rules were taken off, and the provinces were given the opportunity to innovate and reform. Some did, some didn't, and they're responsible to their own populations for that. So some systems work better now than others, but the provinces can also learn from one another. It's a lot easier for BC to learn from Saskatchewan than it is for Ontario to learn from Switzerland. Uh, we're right next door, we can see what's happening, we can study it, we can travel quickly and easily. I, I think there's great magic in having the federal government get out of the business of healthcare, let it back to the provinces who are directly responsible to the populations. I don't understand what the federal government would bring to the table that the provincial government doesn't, other than the ability to tax the entire nation and transfer mm -hmm. money into well, we should all be wanting to get better outcomes. So totally agree with you. L let me ask you uh, just in sort of our final moments here. We, so we do have, we, whenever we're doing our comparisons, we do talk about nation to nation. But as you pointed out, we've got, we've got 10 different healthcare systems, more if you include the territories as well. But looking at the 10 provinces, are you seeing any glimmers of hope? You've identified pretty clearly the things that a province needs to do to move in a direction of a higher functioning system that gives better outcome at lower cost. Where are the bright lights in Canada? What provinces are, are, are leading on this front? Or is the Canada Health Act and the federal spending power and the threat of losing those dollars so overwhelming that nobody's really been prepared to stick their neck out? We have seen some tweaks and some changes across provinces over time. And certainly, even within the, the restrictions of the Canada Health Act, some some policy options are available. Activity-based funding is, as far as the letter of the Canada Health Act is concerned, entirely Canada Health Act compliance. We could change the way we fund hospitals tomorrow. Uh, and unless the federal government really wanted to raise Section 12 about reasonable access, it's okay under the letter of the Canada Health Act. Cost sharing, clearly not. Private competitive provision of hospital services under the letter allowed, permissible. Private parallel health care under the letter of the Canada Health Act allowed. There's actually nothing in the Canada Health Act that says you cannot have a private parallel health care system. There's nothing explicit. But again, Section 12, reasonable access rears its ugly head fairly routinely. Uh, but if we look across the provinces, we have provinces that have innovated. We have Saskatchewan, which created a central registry for waiting lists. One approach, but then they used the private sector to bring the waiting list down and, and embrace that approach. And they made a meaningful impact on their waiting list. We've seen initiatives in Alberta, pilot projects, small projects, but they've happened in the bone and joint uh, approach, where we used a private facility here in Calgary, and again, brought the waiting list down. Quebec has traditionally performed a little bit better than the other provinces on waiting lists historically. And it's a little more of a European style healthcare system. There's, there's a, a little more activity there. They have that private parallel sector now since Shoali. It's very limited, very restricted, but they haven't exploded and got worse waiting times. I think that when we look across the nation, when we're trying to pick a winner among the provinces, we're trying to pick a bad apple out of a batch of really bad apples. There's, there's really no great healthcare system in this province. Even or in this country, there's really no great province. Even in the very best province in this country, we are finding waiting lists that are longer than that, in, in, longer than those in, in any number of other developed nations. National surveys show that Canadians wait longer as a nation than people do in other developed nations around the world. We have some of the longest waiting lists for access to care, according to the Commonwealth Fund. So as much as we want to find a provincial example, I think we've had some great experiments. We've had a great activity-based funding experiment in BC that 
it never really turned into anything massive. Uh, we had a great experiment in Saskatchewan where the private sector helped reduce waiting lists, entirely in line with the experience of countries like Spain and Portugal. We have yet to see a province say, okay, this isn't working. Federal government, you've got to get on board with this because we're wasting taxpayer dollars. We're not looking after patients properly. Let's do a Sweden. Let's let's just move beyond this this model. Let's understand that we are going to be a better universal system if we reform, because we're really not doing universality well today. Let me ask you one other concept that you've written about before that has really stuck in my mind, and you alluded to it earlier, is one of the other things that we need to think about is how we have a purchaser, provider, and evaluator split. So right now we have the same group that is providing the service is the group that's given the money to fund the service, which is the group that then oversees the evaluation of how well the service is doing. So is it any wonder we don't have hospital report cards? And is it any wonder that we don't have a whole springing up of surgical suites that are independent of that system that would hive off some of those dollars? So would any of that structural change be, um, be disallowed under our Canada Health Act? Could you have, they're called different things in different provinces, but a health quality council that has the authority to do genuine real health audits and evaluations and report cards, and it's serious. Could you then also have a separate spending authority? And they make the decision. Yeah, we'll give money to a private hospital or a public hospital or a nonprofit or a charitable organization, but we decide. And then you could still have the uh, traditional services that are run by government run under the same umbrella, but they wouldn't be making those other two decisions. That's sort of how I've been thinking about the structural change that's needed. But is there anything that would be a barrier to that, number one? And is there any place where they do that particularly well that we should be emulating? Um, I think we can look to Germany for, for the great example. There's nothing in the Canada Health Act that would stop a purchaser provider split. Again, in the letter of the Canada Health Act, Section 12 always rears its upper head. Uh, but Section 12 could be used to stop the delivery of hamburgers. Uh, I mean, it's that big. Um, when it comes to the purchaser provider split, I think it's a very important part of activity based funding and a very important add on. And it is about getting government to where government needs to be, not necessarily where government is the less efficient provider and where the private sector can play a stronger role. The private sector is a great insurer. The private sector is a great provider. They're great at looking after patients. The private sector is perhaps less good when it comes to ensuring that everybody has access to a healthcare system on equal terms, because that's the role of government. And we need somebody to look after the system and police it and, and ensure that things are being done properly. Uh, and you're absolutely right. When you say government today in Canada is the payer, the provider, and the monitor. So when they pay for care that isn't delivered properly, they're the ones who go and slap themselves on the wrist. That is a horrendous conflict of interest. Whereas in a country like Germany, government ensures everybody has access. To, it's a Swiss style healthcare system where there is private insurers within the public system. Government ensures everybody has access to the healthcare system or at least to the insurance system. That's their role. They then ensure that the insurers are behaving appropriately. The care is not being denied. The people are receiving the care they need and they are reporting to the public on how this is going and ensuring that the cost structures and payment structures are being, are being looked after and, and are monitoring and are helping set pay schedules competitively with the insurers, but still monitoring. And then when it comes to quality, the federal government is ensuring, or, the, or the, the state governments are ensuring that the data is available, not only to the public to look at based on state analyses, but also available to private individuals who wish to go in and do their own analyses of hospital reporting. So you now have a private individual able to go and download the, the information on a privatized respective basis you can then report and say this hospital does better at these outcomes than that hospital and the state is also reporting these outcomes. So now the government is the monitor, they're the overseer, they're the protector and they're the defender of universality. They are no longer the day-to-day -day provider of healthcare services, which depoliticizes healthcare decision making, increases the time horizon for healthcare decision making and changes the way the healthcare system runs. No longer will you hear a politician say, well next year's a re-election year, I really don't want to do that now because I don't know what the outcome might be and it could go sideways. It's now a hospital administrator who says, well, I don't care when the re-election year is, I want a better hospital a year and a half from now, let's start making that change, let's get down that road and treat patients better because it'll attract more patients to my facility, it'll increase my resources and revenues. And the government is making sure that that is all being done in, a, in, in an appropriate manner and that universality is protected. It's about getting government right, it's not about getting government out, it's about getting, out, getting government out of the things that they don't do well and we know from any number of studies that there are a number of things government clearly doesn't do well. But when it comes to overseeing and ensuring the policy construct is correct, that's the role of government. 
and it's an important role. The, so my takeaway from talking to you today is that, yes, the Canada Health Act has created these anomalies, which has prevented the kind of innovation we're talking about. But there is enough room within the Canada Health Act that we could change the most important thing, which is activity based funding and allowing for a greater diversity of delivery models. And if you could do just those two things, you're already going to start seeing efficiencies that then creates the argument for why you might wanna try incremental different approaches as you go down that path. There's no reason for anyone to get started. There's no reason for political politicians to fear that if they don't do those two things that somehow they're going to be punished by the federal government. Those those could be done. That's that's my takeaway. Uh, have I got the right takeaway? Is there anything more? Am I being let? Am I being not ambitious enough? Is there anything more that you would recommend from an incremental approach that you think could be done today? No, within the bounds of the Canada Health Act, and, and notwithstanding a couple of interpretation letters in the 1990s and 2000s from federal federal health ministers that raised concern about private clinics operating under the public scheme, restricting reasonable access. And there are letters of interpretation from the federal government on that. Uh, but, but all that aside, within the Canada Health Act, the letter of the act, there's nothing stopping activity-based hmm. funding. Uh, and there's, there's really nothing in the letter of the act to say you can't have a broader diversity of providers within the universal scheme in an activity-based funded model. Uh, to, to move us forward. And that would have an incredible impact on the healthcare, on the efficiency of hospital care, on the throughput of patients through the system. We've seen it time and again uh, in European countries that have reformed, how much of a difference this makes. We would have a better healthcare system as a result of reform. There's a window to go through. There's certainly, uh, it increases complexity. There's a lot of thinking to be done. The Canadian Institute for Health Information has actually been doing a lot of this work in the background. There's some very interesting stuff that has come out of them on the technical aspects of activity-based funding. But it could be done, uh, and it really should be done if, if we're interested in the welfare of patients and in the efficiency, uh, in the cost efficiency we're, we're handing over to taxpayers who are funding that care. The only complexity I can see, I'm trying to think of this through a political lens of why they'd be reluctant to do it is if your funding authority runs out of money because they've received a certain allocation, $20 billion in the case of Alberta and probably four times that in the case of Ontario, what happens if you get to September and you've run out of your allocation for the amount you can spend on knee replacements or, or hip replacements? I mean, does, does that happen? Do you, do you just say, okay, we reset next year? Or how, I think that's one of the issues around rationing is everybody's afraid to like control, go, go of control, especially since we have such long waiting lists and such pent up demands. Heck, we might end up seeing a doubling in the cost of the healthcare system. How, how, do, you, how do you control that, the overall amount that's spent? Uh, there are any number of approaches. The beauty of being Canada, I guess in a way, is that we're the last country to go down this road, one of the very last countries to go down this road. Other countries have, have as much as 30 or 40 years of experience in working with activity-based funding and how it works. It's not the entire system, it's a portion of the system. There has to be a global budget backbone for a number of things that occur that, that really don't make sense to activity-based fund. But there's also a total amount of funding, uh, very much like physician services. There are reductions in funding that can occur after a certain amount of services is delivered. Uh, we can have competition in fee setting, which over time, especially as private providers come in, says the OECD, will actually reduce the amount that is paid per surgery, which increases the number of surgeries we provide for a given dollar amount. So the outcome is not at all certain, but what, what is reasonably clear is that we will get more services for the dollar and better services for the mm -hmm. dollar that we are getting now. And any number of policy approaches is available for government to employ to ensure that when we hit those funding limits, the limit of what has actually been allocated for healthcare, we have a mechanism to discourage further activity or at least reduce the pace of further activity by reducing the additional payment that goes out. It could be a 30% or a 50% payment up to a next limit, which is then a 0% payment again, to put some soft breaks onto the end of that. Uh, global budgets are no different though. When the hospital runs out of budget, it's run out of budget. It has to go back to the government and ask for more money or deficit fund knowing that's backed by the government, which is mm -hmm. one of the soft budget constraint problems that we have. Uh, but any number of policy approaches is available. I think when we look at simplicity though, for the provincial government, it changes from a system where they go, okay, hospital, you get X, uh, hospital, you get Y, hospital, you get Z. Okay, we're out, we'll see you guys next year, to a system where they're now getting billing and they have to deal with what are the billing rates? Has this been billed appropriately? What are the comorbidities? What are the complexities? It is far more administratively complex for a provincial government or provincial health authority to handle. On the other hand, we're now taking patients and turning them from a cost to the hospital to a source of additional resources. And that, that turn, has an incredible impact on how the healthcare system operates.
You know, before I let you go, I just want to leave it because you did make one reference to certain types of services that cannot be funded on activity based. I'm assuming that if I have a heart attack and keel over and I need to be taken to the hospital, that's not one thing that would be funded on activity based. You still have emergency room functions of hospitals that have to be there and available to take emergent needs. Am I am I right about that? Uh, certainly emergent needs, some emergent needs could be, but other emergent needs where it's an unknown condition, somebody presents to, to a hospital in ambulance, we have no idea what's going on. That's really not a, a place for activity-based funding. That's a place for global budget funding. That's unpredictable care. That is where you need the big complex tertiary care hospital that is focused on getting the patient cared for, that is well-funded and patient-focused funded in other areas to make sure that that patient is served. Uh, the other area that where activity-based funding really might not work well is where you have extremely complex patients or patients whose care has gone very sideways and now we have multiple comorbidities, multiple simultaneous conditions. That's a very hard care pathway to define. Uh, it's not to say that it can't be defined, but if we look at the international experience, that's usually where activity-based funding hits its limit. Activity-based funding is for predictable care. But remember, the predictable care is, is the majority of what the healthcare system does. The majority of patients are seen for predictable services. It's a small portion of patients that are seen for these very complex things. Uh, and I think we often don't appreciate that we're underserving both with the construct we have now. You're so right. What's your prospect for change? This will sort of be my last conversation or my last question for you, because it seems to me that I'm excited hearing about the way in which other healthcare services are delivered in other countries. I'm excited about the innovation and the new technologies and the work environment that's created. And you would think that those who are working in this existing environment and being stifled by it, not seeing their ideas implemented and only being limited to one uh, operating room space a week, you would think they would be the ones who'd be the staunchest advocates of trying something new. And yet those are the forces that want to keep things exactly as they are. I, I don't understand why somebody wouldn't want to have multiple different employers that they could sell their services to and multiple different environments in which to choose to work. I, 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 what, what, what explains why it is we're so stuck from a labor We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe on YouTube and wherever you stream your podcasts. And to stream old episodes, learn more about the show, and where to subscribe and submit your questions for future guests, visit fraserforum.org.